Okay, welcome back. We're, uh, let me see here. We're on deck. All right. Working on exam 85. Section 2, logical reasoning. We'll start here with question number 11. The issue presented, which one of the following, if uh, true, most helps to resolve the apparent discrepancy? Got it. Paradox. So let me read for what's the paradox. The goal of reforesting uh, degraded land is to create an area with a, a multitude of thriving tree species. Stop, I got it. So that's my goal. My goal, when the land is degraded, like it appears to be around here, when it's degraded, the, uh, <clears throat> the goal is to create an area with a multitude of thriving tree species. Got it. Next sentence. But some experienced land managers using a, a reforesting strategy that involves planting a single fast-growing tree species. Well, let me reread that so I can, I think I got it, but let me reread it. But some experienced land managers use a reforesting strategy that involves planting a single fast-growing uh, tree species. Okay, well to solve that paradox, we have to go from how is it that a single tree species here leads to a thriving multitude of tree species, and that's the answer. I don't, you know, they'll tell me what it is, but that's what's got to be solved. Does A solve that? A says, tree species that require abundant sunlight tend to grow quickly on degraded land. No. How about B? An area with a multitude of thriving tree species tends to be more aesthetically pleasing than an area with only a single tree species. Well, this doesn't have to do with aesthetics or aesthetically pleasing. So, no. C. The reforestation of the of degraded land is generally unsuccessful unless the land is planted with tree species that are native to the area designated for reforestation. Well, I have no knowledge whether or not this single tree species is native to that area or not. I've given no information on it. So, no. Uh, D. The growth of trees attracts wildlife whose activities contribute to the dispersal of a large variety of tree seeds from surrounding area. And that's it. I'm gone. I mean, if you break that down, what they're saying is, when they say the growth of trees, well, the trees refer back to the single fast-growing tree species, right? That is trees. And what happens is the growth of trees attract the wildlife, so the birds. Birds show up, right? Uh, and their activities bring seeds which take my single tree species and over time make it a multitude of tree species. So D is the answer. Uh, e says the process of reforesting degraded sites is time consuming and labor intensive and who cares. And again I would not read E. Alright, question number 12. Uh, we want to weaken the argument. Okay, let's weaken it. Uh, in, in independent, and that says A-N, right? So you want to pay attention to that. It's, it's one. An independent computer service company tallies the service requests it receives for individual brands of personal computers. Okay, so what I'm picking up there, right, is you're talking about one independent computer service company. Okay. It found, I'm sorry, it found that after factoring in each brand's market share, KRV brand computers, had the largest proportion of service requests, whereas Probit brand computers had the smallest proportion of service requests. Stop, I got it. So I'm not arguing with the evidence. You're telling me that with respect to this independent computer company, their experience is uh, a greater percentage of KRV vans, uh, computers, right, um, require service requests than Probit. So if that were my entire universe, I would want to buy ProBit, I guess. Okay, what's, what's the end of this now? Next sentence. Obviously, ProBit is the more reliable personal computer brand. No, that's not obvious at all, because uh, I have no idea whether th that independent contractor was the only independent contractor. I don't even know that you needed a contractor. You might have done the service request in-house. So your mindset is to attack. So this could have been a flaw issue, this could have been an assumption, that they could have done whatever they want with this, but they're telling me to weaken it, right? So to weaken it is, you're relying on the results from A-N, first word, meaning one. Okay, so that one has to be reflective of the all, and it's not going to be because you want me to weaken it. 
Okay, what week is it? A. The proportions of service requests for the other computer brands in the tally were clustered much more closer to ProBit level of service request than to KRV level. That actually strengthens the argument, not weakens it. Because you're really then saying, you know, KRV really stood out as significantly above in terms of these, these service requests. B. For some computer brands, but not for others, most service requests were made to the manufacturer's service department rather than to an independent service company. Well, yeah. Now, I need to think about that. I need, hello, Shelby. This is Shelby. Shelby, you want to come over and say, hello? Oh, what a good girl. What a good girl. Are you protecting us? That's so sweet of you, Shelby. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you, and welcome on deck, Shelby. This is your 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 this is your debut for 2020. I'm so pleased you're here. Now I do have to go back to work. Yes, good, good girl. Okay, so uh, so going back here to question number 11 and saying, uh, do I have this argument? Yeah, yeah, I have it. And then you say, well, uh, I'm sorry. Question, just my question number 11. It's question number 12. Uh, the, that A, the proportion of service requests for the other computer brands in the tally were clustered much closer to probate. Yeah, that, that means, you know, that would strengthen this argument, not weaken it. B, for some computer brands, but not for others, uh, more service requests are made to the manufacturer's service department rather than to an independent service company. So what that would allow me to argue, if that's true, I would then make the argument that the reason that probit uh, is has a lower percent from that contractor of service request is that probit is handling much of this internally and it's never getting there. So I'm going to keep reading, but yes, B, B definitely weakens his argument. C. The company that did the tally receives more service requests for probit brand computers than does any other independent computer service company. Well, okay, but that's not really. <clears throat> in terms of weakening, that, that wouldn't weaken the argument. If anything, it would slightly strengthen it, but not weakening it. D. The computer brands covered in the computer service company's tally differ greatly with respect to their market share. I don't care about their market share. I only care about the number of service requests you had representing the percent of a total and it, it's got nothing to do with your market share. Uh, e Probit has been selling personal computers for many more years than KRV, and I care about that for what reason? I don't. So the answer number 12 is B. Again, that is one where I would have kept reading, um, but it, it clearly weakens the argument. Let's take a look at 13. 13, we want, again, it's another paradox. Which one of the following is true most helps to explain the surprising outcome? Okay, let's we'll see what we have here. So when scientific journals began to offer full online access to their articles, in addition to the traditional printed volume, so when that happened, scientists gained access to more journals and easier access to back issues. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a scientist and now I have more back issues and more journals to I have access to. Surprisingly, this did not lead to a broader variety of articles being cited in new scientific articles. Okay, so let me digest that. So, um, notwithstanding this opening up of information, it didn't lead to a broader variety of articles, right? So topics, think of variety of articles. That's not what it led to. Instead, it led to a greater tendency among the scientists to cite the same articles that their fellow scientists cited. Okay. So that's the paradox. So the paradox, you're just, you're just nailing down the outcome, which is we did this, we have this, this, this uh, development. So we have more journals, we have more back issues. Uh, and the outcome is it led to a greater tendency among scientists to cite the same articles that their fellow scientists cited. That's the outcome. So I'm citing more articles uh, it, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I, when I cite, there's a greater tendency for me to cite using the same article that, you know, Dave had. I like Dave, right? So, so 
So I'm now going and I'm citing more of Dave's articles, not a broader variety of articles. So I have to explain, so why would this opening up of the world lead me, Peter, right, to be citing Dave more often, right, and not reaching a wider variety of issues? Okay. Uh, so I'm like, I'm like this, this, is, this is reasonably in the weeds. Uh, so does A, does A solve this? A few of the most authoritative scientific journals were among the first to offer full online access to their articles. I don't think that has anything to do with the issue. B, scientists who wrote a lot of articles were the most enthusiastic about accessing journal articles online. That's not telling me anything. It's not telling me you, you were enthusiastic and you went online more often. C, scientists are more likely to cite articles by scientists that they know than they are to cite articles by scientists uh, they have never met, even if the latter are more prominent. Uh, uh, so how does that get me to the broader variety? We're, we're expecting a broader variety. We don't get a broader variety. And I don't see C saying it does reach that issue of, you know, I'm more likely to cite somebody I know, right, than I am to cite somebody I've never met, uh, even if the person I've never met is more prominent. But what does that got to do with the variety? I don't think it... Does have anything to do with, with, with a variety. Uh, D. Several new scientific journals appeared at roughly the same time that full online access to scientific articles became commonplace. Again, I, I don't think that, that weighs on this at all. And E. Online searching made it easier for scientists to identify the articles that present the most highly regarded views on an issue which they prefer to cite. Yeah, and that would get me there, because if you break this down, what happened is it became easier for me to find Dave, right? So it's now easier for me to identify the articles that present the most highly regarded views, my most highly regarded view is Dave, on an issue which they prefer to cite. So I'm just looking for articles produced by Dave, uh, which has nothing to do with a variety of articles. I'm looking for Dave's articles, and so E would, uh, of these choices for sure, E would be the answer. And I do think 13 is, I find 13 somewhat more challenging to explain, and so I infer from that uh, it's, it had a higher level of difficulty, but perhaps not. 14, which one of the following gets true most strengthens the researcher's arguments? So now I put my strengthening hat on. Maybe you should take this hat on and off, you know? Every one of the, you know, then, then it's a paradox, right? Now it's strengthening. Okay, so I'm going to strengthen. And here's what I want to do. Researcher. People are able to tell whether a person is extroverted just by looking at pictures in which the person has a neutral expression. You stop, there's a period. All right, I'm looking at a person with a neutral expression and I can tell that person's extroverted. Okay, next sentence. Since people are also able to tell whether a chimpanzee behaves dominantly just by looking at a picture of the chimpanzee's expressionless face, I'm gonna stop there for a second. I just wanna, I, I, I get there's more coming, but. So this is an analogy, and the analogy is just as for a human, I can look at this expressionless person and say they're extroverted. For a chimp, I can look at this expressionless chimp and, in, and, and uh, identify that chimp as dominant. So there's a, a, a connection between extroverted and dominant. Okay. And since both humans and chimpanzees are primates, so something we share in common, we conclude that this ability is probably not acquired solely through culture, but rather as a result of primate biology. All right, I got it. So in order to strengthen this argument, we have to draw a connection between extroversion in uh, humans, dominant behavior in chimps, uh, both coming from expressionless faces, right? And then we have to attribute that ability to biology. And I want to strengthen that argument. So it's biology connected to the uh, extroversion in humans and uh, dominance in uh, chimps. Hey, 
people are generally unable to judge the dominance of bonobos, which are also primates, by looking at them, by looking at pictures of them. Uh, I'm not saying that weakens the argument, because you're saying it's another primate. B, people are able to identify a wider variety of personality traits from pictures of other people than from pictures of chimpanzees. I have no clue how that would strengthen this argument. C, extroversion in people and dominant behavior in chimpanzees are both indicators of a genetic predisposition to assertiveness. Yeah, I'm going to keep reading, but yeah, because th that's, t that's connecting extroversion in people. That was the first thing I was introduced to. Dominant behavior in chimps, second thing I was introduced to, are both indicators of a genetic disposition, which is the argument's conclusion that comes from primate biology, to assertiveness. So we're, we're connecting the assertiveness, which is a attribute of a primate, to these two, uh, to these two traits. D, any common ancestor of humans and chimps would have to have lived over seven million years ago. I have no clue where that came from. E, some of the pictures of the people used in the experiments were composites of several different people. That certainly would not strengthen this argument. So the answer to question number 14 is C for Caligula. Let's just close out this session on 15. The reasoning in the argument above is most vulnerable to criticism on the following grounds. So I'm looking for law. All right, what do I have? All the apartments on 20th Avenue are in old houses. So stop for a second. I, I'm, I'm thinking of 20th Avenue in Queens because, well, you know, I'm from the city. And I'm thinking, all right, so if you're telling me all the apartments on 20th Avenue are in old houses, okay, I, I got it. Next sentence. However, there are twice as many apartments on 20th Avenue as there are old houses. I got it. I got it. So, I got you know, a number of things going through my mind here. Uh, uh, there could be one apartment building with, uh, you know, uh, a, a bunch of, of, of uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, with a bunch of uh, apartments in it, or they could be equal, evenly distributed. But, but I got here that there are twice as many apartments as there are old houses, so they got to be some apartments that are in the same house. Uh, this conclusion, however, is therefore most old houses on 20th Avenue contain more than one apartment, and that's just not, that just doesn't follow at all, because you could have the vast majority of the apartments in a single old house. Um, so the conclusion there that most old houses on 20th Avenue contain more than one apartment is flawed, and the reason it's flawed is there may be multiple houses on, on uh, 20th Avenue that have three or more units. There may be one house that has 70 units. So. Okay, uh, so is A the flaw that it overlooks the possibility that some of the buildings on 20th Avenue are not old houses? No, this is only about old houses. B, draws a conclusion that simply restates one of the premises offered in support of the conclusion. No, in my mind, so didn't produce that. And this is where they have you fly fishing. Be patient, be patient, right? You have all the time in the world. Be patient, just fly fish for a while. That's got nothing to do with what my mind produced, and I'm not, I'm not here for, you know, to be a philosophical diddle time. So, no. C. It fails to consider the possibility that some buildings on 20th Avenue may offer types of rental accommodations other than apartments. Shoot me. This is about apartments and old houses. That's it. D. Confuses a condition whose presence would be sufficient to ensure the truth of the argument's conclusion with a condition whose presence is required in order to, in order for the conclusion to be true. You can get to fly fishing, you get, whoa, whoa, let me be patient. Well, that's got nothing to do with this. This is, there's going to be a house on there with uh, multiple houses with uh, three or more units. E fails to address the possibility that a significant number of old houses on 20th Avenue contain three or more apartments. I don't know about you, but I'm picking E, and again here, what IRAC does, so long as you have formed roughly the contours of that answer in your mind, it is, it is a, uh, 
a protection against B and D. It is a protection against going into a rat hole and just simply dying there. So the answer to number 15 is E for Euphrates.